So today I thought I'd have a quick video on no limb. Hopefully it's not as long as the upper limb video, but it's just going to be a brief summary going over the bones, blood vessels, and then I'll try combining the muscles and the nerves together. So before we get on to the actual lower limb, I thought it would be quite helpful to have, or just to show a bit of a memory aid when learning these back muscles. So if you have a pencil or anything, just put that on the table and then I'll draw one out and hopefully this will help you remember a good way of remembering these somewhat random muscles. So if you just put this on the table, what this pencil is showing is your vertebra, the actual spine. Then you just put your fingers next to it like this. And so here you go, index finger, your middle finger, your ring finger, and the same on the other side. And what this is basically showing is each of the fingers will represent one of these muscles. And then the pencil is obviously the actual spine. So initially you have your index finger, which is the one closest to the spine. So that's going to be spinalis, which is this blue muscle here. And so the reason why I, your index finger is spinalis is just because it's the closest one to the spine. The next you've got your middle finger, which is the longest finger. So that's going to be longissimus, which is the yellow muscle here. And then you've got your ring finger, which is this kind of red muscle here. I'm just with the yellow muscle, sorry. Um, then the ring finger, which is iliocostalis. If you break down this word, ilio and costalis, ilio kind of relating to where it inserts on the um, pelvis, and then costalis kind of meaning ribs. So hopefully this is a nice little way to help you remember these muscles. Okay. So now let's actually go on to the pelvis and start the lower limb. So the pelvis is made up of three bones. You've got the ilium, ischium, pubis. What you have is this here is the end of the spinal cord. Well, not spinal, um, spinal vertebra. This, must, uh, this bone here is called the sacrum and it's kind of all fused together. And then you've got here's your pelvis and then you've got your legs kind of down here, the femurs. So like I said, three different types of bones. I tried to colour them in for you here. So this kind of reddish pink one is the ilium. This kind of bluey purple one is the pubis and this green one is the ischium. So this joint here quickly is called the sacroiliac joint. Sacro because it's We've got the sacrum and then iliac because it's the iliac, iliac uh, the ilium bone and then this kind of bit there is the iliac fossa and this whole bit is kind of the, the wing of the iliac so if we now look at this picture this pink line here is the iliac crest and then what you have is these red stars that i've put on so these are just different bony landmarks that you can feel on your pelvis. This top one especially is very important and quite a good bony landmark to feel. You can feel on yourself quite easily. This is ASIS. So anterior superior iliac spine. Then if you've got an anterior superior iliac spine, that means you have to have an anterior inferior iliac spine. If you've got anterior, that means you have to have posterior ones. So posterior superior iliac spine, and then the posterior inferior iliac spine, because one's above and then one's below. So, oh, I should have said as well. So you have all these three different pelvic bones, and they all kind of join together at this bit, which is called the acetabulum. That's where the femur will then sit. So then moving on to the pubic bone so you've got the this kind of bit here and then this bit here and then a knobbly bit in the middle the top bit will be the the superior pubic ramus and the bottom bit will be the inferior pubic ramus and then you've got the body of the pubic body which is the bit that kind of joins it together knobbly bit and then you have the pubic 
synthesis, which kind of sits connecting them there. If you've got a pubic ramus, then you're probably going to have the ischial ramus. So here you've got the ischial, uh, superior ischial ramus, and here you've got the inferior ischial ramus, and then you've got the body of the ischium. When you're sitting down, you're actually sitting down on the ischium and a particular part, which is called the, is uh, the ischial tuberosity. So that'll be kind of there. So hopefully that's just a bit of a brief summary of the way that the pelvic bones all work together. There's a lot of ligaments as well that hold the pelvic bones together and create different types of foramen. Uh, oh, I forgot to also say, so there's, if we look at the pelvic here, the pelvis here, you'll come across terms like true pelvis and false pelvis. So what that refers to is this bit here is like the false pelvis and this bit here is the true pelvis. What divides it? Well, you've got this kind of, if we draw a line here around this kind of hole that you can see, that's called the pelvic broom. Above that will be the false pelvis and then below that will be the true pelvis. What's the difference? The false pelvis kind of contains all different organs that you would imagine that would kind of sit here in the body. And then the true pelvis, you're gonna to have, to have things like the pelvic floor muscles. What do they do? They kind of keep everything inside of you just so all the organs don't fall straight through you. So they're quite helpful. Um, and so this is called the pelvic inlet. You also have these holes here that I've got to say. So those are the obturator foramen. They won't just remain, the foramen means hole. Um, they won't just stay as a hole. They're actually covered by the obturator membrane. Part of that, so it's almost something like that. And then there's going to be a hole coming through, which is the obturator canal. And then you can have things like the obturator nerve, artery and vein, which can go through there. Something else that you'll have. So you'll have, like I said before, different types of ligaments. I'm not really going to go into that now because they can get quite confusing. But things to bear in mind are things like the sacrospinal ligaments and the sacrotuberous ligaments. Um, what they do is they create those ligaments create different for uh, frame so if we go to this green um, star there that is the ischial spine because it's part of the ischial bone and then it's sticking out so what happens there is you have the sacrum which isn't actually drawn here but if it's kind of going something like that what you get is a ligament connecting the ischial spine to the sacrum Cause, uh, which is called the sacrospinal ligament and you also have the sacrotuberous ligament which connects the sacrum to the tubercles. So what they do is they create the greater and lesser sciatic foramen and that's obviously the ligaments aren't on here but here would be the greater uh, sciatic foramen and here would be the lesser one which is what these stars are supposed to show if the ligaments were there. You've also got the inguinal ligament, which kind of goes, runs like that. And that's a division, just to, to be aware of. It'll probably be covered in first year, but just a brief reminder of it as well. So hopefully that kind of all makes sense. Oh, and one other thing. So as we're already moving on to the femur now you'll have this kind of bit that i've drawn with the dotted line like i said before all of this bit is the acetabulum if you literally put your fist in your other hand that's literally the way that the femur will sit in the pelvis one of the things is obviously you want to try making this as deep a uh, cup as possible so that you're not getting going to get any dislocations of the hip one of the ways you can do that is using the is having an acetabulum, acetabular labrum. So the way that you can kind of think of this is if you have a trench, the way to make that trench deeper rather than digging down is you can put like sandbags on the top. So then the actual depth of it still increases. The labrum is like those sandbags. It adds layers kind of around there and then it makes the whole cup off the acetabulum deeper which means that it's safer and it's less likely for the femur to fall out okay 
So moving on to this kind of bit now, you will have, like I said, four different ligaments. I'm not really going to go into them now, but they're here. So the iliofemoral, ischiofemoral, and pubofemoral. You can see that femoral is relating to femur, and these ones are relating to these different bones. So match them up. Um, they will all kind of sit around there and try making it a as solid and as strong as possible. So you're not going to get a dislocation. But I will include a video in the description that can actually show you the different ligaments and it's quite a good video. Okay, so if we now go down, what you have is, like I said before, you've got the pelvis here and you've got this bone here, which is the femur, this one here, um, the patella, tibia, fibula, and you've got these ones here, which are the tarsal bones, metatarsals, and then phalanges. So we'll just start going through them. With the femur, you've got the head of the femur, which sits inside the acetabulum, which is about there. Then you have the neck of the femur coming down there. And then after that, you have these kind of knobbly bits. This is the trochanter. So you have the greater trochanter and the lesser trochanter. These are the points where muscles will insert onto. Uh, this one's the uh, greater trochanter. The lesser trochanter is slightly on the back, so you can't really see it here. Also on the, as you're going, like heading down the femur, on the back of the femur, again, you can't really see it here, you'll have things like the gluteal tuberosity, which starts, is kind of like a Y shape. Then it goes down into the linear aspera, and then it starts to then divide again to the medial and lateral supracondylar lines. So the next thing you'll see is these knobbly bits on the other side, and these are then the medial and lateral condyles. So this is then the lateral side, this is then the medial side, which means that this will be the medial uh, condyle and this will be the lateral condyle. What's the difference between condyles and epicondyles? Well, the epicondyles sit above, and epicondyles are sites for muscles to attach to, while the, con uh, the condyles are for bone to bone articulation. The patella is now a bit in the way, but if you removed it, you'd get kind of this kind of shape at the bottom of the femur. That would then be called the intercondylar notch. Let's just get rid of that. Then going back to this, so yeah, you've got the patella. The patella is the largest sesamoid bone in the body. You have sesamoid bones, it sounds a bit like sesame seeds, if that helps you remember. You've got them in your thumb, you've got them in your foot. But the largest one is the patella. So above the patella is the quadriceps tendon, and then below the patella will be the um, patella ligament. When you're trying to do a tendon uh, patella reflex, like testing for the reflex, you'll be hitting the patella ligament. So to make yourself look professional, just feel it, or like try and palpate for the patella first and then hit it. And then hopefully you should get a reflex. If not, just try again. Um, so then going on to the next bit, you've then got this bone here and this bone here. This bigger one is called the tibia and this smaller one here is called the fibula. So with the tibia and fibula, there are things to bear in mind. They articulate at two points here and here. So this would be the um, proximal tibiofibula joint, proximal being near, then distal, distance, so further away, that is then the distal tibiofibula joint. And like most bones, you've got the head and the neck, so head of the uh, fibula and then neck of the fibula, and then kind of going down. The other things you've got, like in the arm between the radius and the ulna, you have kind of this interosseous membrane, which sits in between, kind of connecting them together. And yeah, so something else kind of going on to the knee, focusing on here a bit more. Um, yeah, I'll just kind of touch on this a bit. You've got these things called the cruciate ligaments, cruciate meaning cross. So as you've probably seen, I'm not a great drawer, but they kind of sit something like that inside if you remove the patella and then look inside. 
these basically check and like these kind of hold the knee in place. So you have an anterior cruciate ligament and a posterior cruciate ligament. The anterior cruciate ligament, it prevents the knee basically like this part of the leg just flying forward. And the posterior cruciate ligament prevents this part of the leg flying backwards. So you can test this and actually if one of them's injured, so you've probably heard like, oh, you know, footballers have an ACL injury or something. That's their anterior cruciate ligament. All that's referring to, I will try and draw it. Let's say that's their femur. Here's their knee. And then let's say that's the rest of their leg. It looks very broken. Um, so if they've got a torn ACL, that's the least of their problems. But what you can do, so you can test for your um, posterior cruciate ligament with this thing called the posterior sag test. So what that would look like is, let's say that they'll be sagging, i.e. they'll be drooping of this part of the leg going down. Best to look at images as opposed to relying on this. What if you have some kind of ACL injury, you can test that by pulling in this direction. Very gently, and obviously not very like hard, but if there is a problem with the ACL, this is called the anterior draw test. So you're pulling the leg slightly forward, and then if it just comes really close to you, i.e. like there's not a lot of strength there, there's some kind of problem with the person's ACL. Let's just get rid of this now. <laughs> okay, so another thing to talk about is this thing called the unhappy triad. So the unhappy triad. What this is, there's going to be the ACL problem, medial meniscus, and the um, medial collateral. So like in the arm, you've got collateral ligaments that kind of sit there and there, one being the medial, one being the lateral, and they kind of help keep the knee in support. You've also got these things called menisci, which sit between the femur and the um, tibia. So you've got a medial and a lateral one. What the unhappy triad is, is where all of these three get injured. So you've spoken about the ACL, the medial meniscus sits kind of there, and then the medial collateral ligament sits there. So what this is, is let's say this person was putting their full weight down on this leg, i.e. they're fully standing on it. Now somebody hits them at the side of their knee there in that kind of direction, that force. So a lateral blow to, uh, blow to the lateral side of their knee. These three get injured. What happens is rather than your knee going down like that, this bit gets stressed and gets hurt. And so now something like that kind of happens. And then, yeah, these three get hurt. So learn those three because that's a very common thing to remember and get tested on. Something else to cover as well is the different bursa around the knee. So if we just get rid of oh, all of this, what you have is, let's go to green. Um, what you have is different bursa, so they're like fluid filled sacs. You can have one kind of sitting here, and then one slightly below. So the top one is the pre patella bursa. So if this gets, that's this one, pre patella bursa, and then this one below is the infra patella bursa, so infra patella bursa. What happens here is if these get inflamed, i.e. these then lead to bursitis. How do you remember them? Well, the pre patella bursa gets inflamed, and that's then called housemaid's knee. If you think about the way a housemaid is on, let's say that they're scrubbing the floor or something, um, that part of the knee is where their weight's going to be on. The next one, the infra patella bursa, infra being below the patella, pre kind of in front of, uh, the infra patella bursa is clergyman's knee. So this is if you picture a clergyman trying to pray, this part of the knee is what's actually going to be in contact and that's where the weight's going to be. So that's kind of 
telling you which part of the knee is going to be inflamed, which bursa is going to be inflamed. Okay. Oh. Okay. So, the next thing to go over is the tarsal tunnel. So, you probably remember there's the carpal tunnel in your hand and there is one in your foot. So, on the medial side, which is here, you have a, another flexor uh, retinaculum, which is a ligament that sits over on the medial side, connecting from like your ankle, and so that sits over, and then these different structures pass through. If you have think of carpal tunnel syndrome, you can also get tarsal tunnel syndrome. Uh, what structures actually go through the tarsal tunnel? Well, that's these ones here. So if we zoom in. There is a way you can remember this because it just looks very random. So you've got Tom, Dick, and very nervous Harry. So this is just a quick way you can try remembering what's going on. And this kind of covers the tarsal tunnel. So there is a pathology there, tarsal tunnel syndrome. Okay, so now moving on to the actual feet or foot. We'll go over the different names of the bones and you'll see that there's a lot of similarity with the hand so I'm not going to go into it in too much detail. What you have here, um, okay, this bone here is the uh, calcaneus. calcaneus. This is like your heel bone so you might have heard of the calcaneal tendon, that's your Achilles tendon, that then inserts on from here and then it is a continuation of the gastrocnemius muscle. And then it kind of loops under here and then it kind of continues as well into the um, plantar aponeurosis. What this next bone is here, this is where you're kind of having the articulation with the tibia. So going up to here again. This is your ankle, so this is called the talus. And then it, the name of the ankle, that's the malleolus. So you've got a medial malleolus and a lateral malleolus. Medial being on the inside, lateral being on the outside. So then you've got these kind of bones now, which all kind of get a little bit mixed up in people's heads. So we'll go through it. This one here is called the navicular bone. And this one here, because it's supposed to be a bit like a box, is the cuboid. How do you not get these mixed up? Navicular kind of sounds like navy or nautical, so something about ships, but I don't see anything related to ships here, but if that helps you remember it, maybe. Um, the way I'd remember it is in terms of the alphabet, uh, in terms of the alphabet, so L-M-M-O-P, so M and N are next to each other, so this is the navicular is on the medial side, and if you want to continue on to remember cuboid, L, M, N, O, cuboid has an O. Maybe that helps you remember it. Then you've got these three bones here. These are the cuneiform. It's three of them, so how do you tell the difference? Well, you've got a medial, a middle, and a lateral. There's a medial and a middle, sounds a little bit confusing, but medial just further inside, middle is between the two of them, and then lateral, further outside. So that is all of the tarsal bones. So these are tarsals. How do you get them not mixed up with the carpals, which are in your hand? Tarsals, toes. Um, carpals, catching, you know, with your hands. Next bit is these, these are the metatarsals, same kind of format as the hands, so I'm not going to go into them. Uh, this is one, this is two, this is three, four, and five. Then you've got the phalanges, which are there. The, they all have similar naming systems to the hand, so like the tarso metatarsal joint, same here because tarsals and metatarsals, um, metatarso phalangeal joints, same there, and then you've got the interphalangeal joints, so the proximal and the distal. Proximal being near and distal being far. So 
don't really need to spend too much on that. One of the other things to remember is I will try drawing again. Ignore the bad drawing and just try and stick to the anatomy. <laughs> Let's say that this is someone's foot. You have different ligaments going at the bottom of the foot. So you've got a short one, like there, a long one, and then slightly longer. The short one is called the short plantar ligament. The long one is called the long plantar ligament. And this one here is the plantar aponeurosis. So that's the continuation of the Achilles heel, or the calcaneal tendon. Uh, Achilles heel, uh, Achilles tendon, sorry. And what you can get is these help form the arch of the foot. If someone's flat-footed or pes planus, which is the medical way of saying it, there's something wrong with the ligaments in there in someone's foot. So for example, like the spring uh, spring ligament as well. There are a lot of ligaments connecting all of the structures in the foot and stuff. I'm not going to go into them. Um, they're fairly self-explanatory names and they're quite logical. So they connect what bone to what bone and so you just have to go through it one of the things i will say though is you've got this thing called the deltoid ligament that's on the medial side there um if you've everted your foot so if you think about what that motion is it's the idea of um let's say you're lifting up you the outside of your foot trying to lift it up and you're pointing the sole of your foot outwards that's eversion you damage and that you're stretching the medial side of your foot that's the deltoid ligament that's one way you can kind of sprain your ankle. Okay, so now going on to the next bit. Let's get rid of this image as well. <laughs> okay, so we'll go over the different blood vessels, arteries first and then veins, and then we will move on to the muscles and the nerves kind of combined together. Okay. So for the arteries, where does it start from? Well, it goes from the heart, loops down the aorta, down to the abdominal aorta. That's that. What happens next? Well, the abdominal aorta is going to divide into the common, the right and left common iliac arteries. That's that and that. If, as a general rule, if you've got a common something, so here the common iliac artery, that's then going to further divide. So you're going to have an external and an internal. And then those are going to kind of branch off and provide uh, oxygen to different structures. So as a bit of a general rule, it's not completely correct, but for the sake of simplicity and when learning, you can think of the external uh, iliac artery that goes on to supply the leg, or the internal iliac artery goes on to supply kind of the pelvic muscles and um, the pelvis so let's just quickly label so common iliac artery and then external iliac artery internal iliac artery okay so the external uh, so before i go on to the external iliac i'll just quickly say something about the internal iliac you're going to have different structures kind of coming up this so for example the um, superior and inferior gluteal arteries the superior and inferior, inferior gluteal arteries, they are divided by the piriformis muscle. So superior is obviously above piriformis and inferior gluteal is below piriformis. And they can also supply like the posterior thigh as well. Uh, you also have the interior pudendal artery and you have the obturator artery as well. And then that divides into anterior and posterior branches as well. So I'm just going to put dot, dot, dot there that supplies areas you have the external we'll go back to the external um iliac artery now so the external iliac artery comes down the leg and it then becomes the once it's crossed the inguinal ligament it becomes so we'll just draw a bit of a line there it becomes the um femoral artery so put femoral artery Coming down, the femoral artery then divides, so you kind of have it looking something like that. So you have then like the deep 
femoral artery kind of branches off. The deep femoral artery can divide into like the lateral and medial circumflex arteries. So the lateral circumflex artery can kind of supply the lateral side of the leg, and the medial um, circumflex artery can supply the neck of the femur. So that's kind of going up to this bit here again. If some kind of problem occurs in the medial circumflex uh, femoral artery, that can lead to avascular necrosis. If, for example, there's a fracture in the femur, that leads to avascular necrosis. Uh, okay, going back here. So then you've got the um, deep femoral, and that can also then have perforating branches and structures as well. Um, what happens from the femoral artery going down? It goes through the adductor hiatus. So we'll just put a little hole there, that's in the muscle. And then it becomes the popliteal artery. I'll draw it like that. Now it's the popliteal artery. You also have to have supplying uh, the areas of the knee. So kind of going like that. Those are called the genicular arteries. These kind of all anastomose together, and there's a lot of anastomosis there. The reason for that is when you're moving your knee, you still need blood supply to all those different areas. So and that is by the genicular arteries. Uh, it's about like that. What happens after that? You have the popliteal artery that is a pulse point that you can feel. Um, then that goes down. Then it starts to divide a bit. This can get a little bit confusing, but just try sticking with it. So we're going to divide it into two. So here you've got the anterior um, tibial artery. And then you've got the tibiofibular trunk, or you might see this word perineal. Perineal is basically the same as fibula. It's just a slightly older version. But they're exactly the same thing. So you have the um, tibio fibula trunk. If you break down this word tibio fibula and it's a trunk, you can probably guess that what that's going to divide into is something related to the tibia and something related to the fibula. And it does. So the it branches off like that, and you get the fibula artery and the posterior tibial artery. The reason why it's posterior is, well, you already have an anterior, that already hints that you're going to get a posterior tibial artery. So, fibula, artery, and the posterior tibial artery. Okay, where does all of this now go? Well, this is going to continue down along the, um, behind the fibula. The anterior tibial artery, that's going to continue down as well. And that's going to go through the interosseous membrane and it's anterior to the, tibia and the, uh, to the tibia and the fibula. This then continues down into the foot where it then becomes this very important artery called the dorsalis pedis. And um, the posterior also comes down, posterior tibial artery comes down as well. What you get is the posterior tibial artery kind of splits off them into the uh, lateral plantar and medial plantar. So lateral plantar, medial plantar. The lateral plantar and dorsalis pedis kind of anastomose together and form this artery it's called the arcuate arch or the deep plantar arch. That then has branches off for like the dorsal metatarsal arteries and dorsal digital arteries supplying the toes. So that's just a bit of an overview of how the arteries in the leg work. Um, the abdominal aorta, uh, abdominal aorta going to the common iliac, external iliac for the leg, femoral, popliteal, popliteal then divides into the anterior tibial artery and the tibiofibular trunk tibiofibular trunk then divides into posterior tibial artery and fibula arteries they then all kind of go down and they all kind of meet in the foot to supply the toes with mainly remembering dorsalis pedis and arcuate arteries okay 
let's just go into the veins. So we will um, continue from um, like down here, just because that makes sense. And sense the blood travels down, and then it has to travel back up. So we go to blue for veins. Um, oh, also to say, there's also then just the naming system. I haven't obviously covered all of the arteries here, but something like the Maniola arteries, they have like, if you just think of when learning all of this, try thinking as logically as possible, it will then help so rather than having to just memorize the stuff. They all have fairly logical names of where they are and the structures around them. Um, okay, so let's just go on to the veins. So the thing to remember about the veins is that they are made up of deep and superficial. The deep veins kind of follow the same naming and same kind of um, direction as the arteries and they're under deep fascia. They're also held within like the same vascular sheath. The reason for that is it also helps the blood to then travel back up to the body. If it's all held kind of, if you think of like a tube kind of thing as the vascular sheath, and inside it is the artery and the vein, which is held together, that pulsatile nature of the artery helps push the blood up in the vein. So it just helps blood to return. Um, then you have the superficial vein. These are in subcutaneous tissue, and these don't follow the same um, flow and naming system as the arteries. Okay, so let's start back down here. What you have is um, the dorsal, digital, and metatarsal. We'll start with the deep uh, layer of veins first, and then we'll go to the superficial after. So with the deep, we'll start off with the dorsal, digital, metatarsal veins, so like that. And then they all kind of join together and then they kind of go up in the same naming systems as all of this. So you have an anterior tibial vein, you have a fibular vein, you have a posterior tibial vein. So I'll just kind of draw these up like that. And they all kind of combine. So the fibular vein joins the posterior tibial vein like the fibular artery joins, uh, is branching off of the tibio fibular trunk, I can kind of divide like that. Um, so the uh, fibular vein is posterior to the lateral malleolus, and that supplies the sole of the foot, while the um, posterior tibial vein is posterior to the medial malleolus. So that's the inside of the foot. Um, then after that, each of these go back up, like the arteries, into the popliteal vein. And then from the popliteal vein, it goes up to the femoral vein. And then from the femoral vein, it goes to the external iliac, which then goes to the common iliac vein, which then goes to the inferior vena cava. And then you also obviously have like the internal iliac vein, which then combines with the external to form the common iliac vein. The... Um, it's the inguinal canal, which is what separates the femoral vein versus the external iliac vein. And then uh, that's basically following the same structure as all the arteries, which is why I haven't labeled it. What I will label is the superficial veins. So the way that this works is slightly different. So like I said before, they all travel in subcutaneous tissue. You've got two main things to think about, the great saphenous vein and the small saphenous vein. The great saphenous vein, uh, this is goes anterior to the medial malleolus. So that kind of, if I change this, that kind of sits up like this, and goes all the way up there. Great saphenous vein, there. Then you, if you've got a great one, that means you've got to have a small one. So the small one goes up like this and then joins to the popliteal vein. And this is posterior to the lateral malleola, uh, malleolus. And uh, so this is a small 
softness. Okay, so where do these kind of come from? This bit here, the dorsal venous network, of the, or the dorsal venous arch. This kind of has superficial veins that you see. These then go up to the great saphenous vein. Um, something about great saphenous vein, sometimes this can be removed from the body to then be used to replace for different um, surgical procedures if they might need more almost blood vessels for the different um, procedures. Okay, so hopefully that kind of gives a bit of an overview of the blood vessels of the lower limb. What we'll do now is go on to the muscles and nerves together. So the way that the lower limb works is it's quite nice, it's quite compartmentalised as opposed to the upper limb. We'll start off with the gluteal region, so this is then linking back to the pelvic anatomy. You could kind of divide it into two different categories. You've got the superficial abductors and extenders, and then the deep lateral rotators. The gluteal region is kind of, if you have to try, if you can't remember any um, blood vessels, just guess superior and inferior gluteal, gluteal arteries. And they su supply quite a lot of these structures. Um, something to remember. When learning the names of the nerves, you can probably already see that they're quite logical. They, they make a lot of sense. So, for example, the nerve for piriformis is nerve to piriformis. The nerve to obturator internus is nerve to obturator internus. Um, so, going forward, what do each of these mean? So, superficial abductors and extenders. Abductor taking away from the body. So, you have the um, pelvis. Uh, let's say it's like something like that. Here's the um, the ilium, and you'll have at different points kind of the insertion points for gluteus maximus, medius, and minimus. Something to remember about gluteus medius and minimus is that if there's some kind of problem here, that can lead to a there's a clinical pathology related to this, which is Trendelenburg gait. So this is drooping of the pelvis on the contralateral side. The best thing to do is just watch a YouTube video with um, with someone walking with Trondelenburg gait and then recognise the different types of gait, for example, like scissor gait, and then relate it to the pathology and why this is being presented in that way. Hopefully that made sense. What you then got is... So you've got each of these, so gluteus maximus, medius, minimus, and tensor fascia lata. These are the superficial abductors and extenders, and these are the um, nerves that go with it. Deep lateral rotators, if you think of what's getting rotated, so the femur is going to be rotated. Um, kind of lateral side, so if you think of the same way your arm can move laterally, your leg can do the same, and that's with these different muscles here. Uh, try seeing how they all fit together first, and like, you can see that they come in pairs like gemellus and obturator, and then quadratus femoris and uh, piriformis are kind of separate. Piriformis, remember, divides the superior and inferior gluteal arteries, and so that's kind of if you have to try identifying the superior and inferior gluteal arteries, if you can identify piriformis, just look above and just look below. Okay. Moving on now to the actual, to the thigh. So if we just do a cross section of this part of the leg, what you get is something that looks like this. You have you can then divide the leg, uh, the thigh up quite nicely. So you've got an anterior compartment, medial compartment, and posterior compartment. The anterior compartment is supplied by a femoral nerve. So this is the femur. Um, the way you can remember which nerve kind of supplies what is just FOS. F O S. Starting from the front bit of your leg, the anterior part of your thigh, sorry not leg. Um yeah the difference is obviously this is the thigh and then this is the leg. Then you've got the knee here, ankle and foot, and then pelvis above. Um 
so looking at the anterior compartment front bit of the thigh start off with femoral then you go to the inside which is obturator and then the back which is sciatic nerve so fos um these are the different muscles that are in the anterior compartment you have the quadricep muscles which are these ones uh, these are fairly logical to remember the rectus femoris is the one that's a little bit hard to remember because it doesn't fit in with the same pattern as the vastus lateralis intermedius medialis and then just having to remember these ones so what these do is they extend the leg at the knee joint so if you think about just straightening your leg basically that is because of the muscles in the anterior compartment and that's what it means by extending the leg at the knee joint for the medial compartment now you have these muscles you can think of this as like hip adductor so adductor you're bringing back closer to the midline this is supply the obturator nerve and most of it is the obturator artery except for gracilis which is the femoral artery it's not completely comp like compartmentalized as nicely as these um then you go to the posterior compartment where you have the sciatic nerve which supplies it and this is flexor of the knee so this is now going to be the opposite to the anterior compartment so just bending your knee uh, sciatic nerve comes from the sacral plexus l4 to s3 and you've got the uh, hamstrings here so you've got biceps femoris semitendinosus and semimembranosus so biceps femoris is the most lateral muscle and then semimembranosus the most medial if you can remember it in this order then you just remember membranosus there for medial and that's how to remember the different ways that the hamstrings are set up for biceps femoris it's got a little bit of a different supply for the nerves you've got the long head of biceps femoris is by the tibial division and then the short head the common tibular division okay so hopefully that makes sense now we will look at the uh, left leg even though actually this is the right leg but yeah so what you've got with the left leg a similar kind of division you've got the anterior compartment lateral compartment and posterior compartment anterior compartment this is now all related to movements of the foot so dorsiflexion and inversion lateral compartment eversion and then posterior compartment uh, posterior compartment plantar flexion and inversion so what's what movement if we start off with the anterior compartment what movement is dorsiflexion that is pointing your toes up so the top of your foot where dorsalis pedis the artery is that is the dorsum of your foot underneath is the sole of your foot and so the dorsiflexion is pointing your toes up if you want you can remember it as plantar flexion where do plants grow from the ground so you point your toes down so this is then the opposite and pointing your toes down and then inversion will then tilt your foot where the sole of your foot is pointing towards the midline eversion is then the opposite where the sole of your foot is pointing towards uh, away from the midline these are the muscles that are in the anterior compartment uh, then these are the muscles for the lateral compartment longus meaning long brevis meaning short um hallucis meaning like toe so this is kind of that's the equivalent of like polysis for the upper limb and then again you can kind of just break down what each of them mean and that will tell you what it does so extending the big toe and it's the longer muscle that means it's probably going to be a extensor hallucis brevis somewhere in the foot all of the brevis muscles are normally in the actual foot so that makes it a bit easier to remember while well, longest are kind of in the leg because they're longer muscles the posterior compartment is bigger uh, than the anterior and lateral the posterior compartment divides into the superficial layer and the deep layer and so this is supplied by the tibial nerve if you feel the back of your leg what you're feeling is gastrocnemius 
This is supplied by uh, this gets its blood supplied by the sural artery, and so does plantaris. Plantaris is the muscle that unlocks the knee. I oh, know, sorry, that's uh, popliteus. Um, yeah, so um, gastrocnemius and plantaris, sural artery. The superficial layer is supplied by branches of the popliteal artery. Then you go to the deep layer where you've got the uh, popliteus muscle this is the muscle that unlocks the knee if you're thinking about them locking the knee that is the cruciate ligaments why do you want to lock your knees if you're just standing up straight by having your knees locked you're reducing the amount of effort you need to actually just stand up and then that means that your weight is going straight through your body as opposed to try like i mean just try it for yourself try standing with unlocked knees for even a few minutes and you'll like know that it's a lot more tiring than if you just lock your knees um what is locking your knees your leg could being completely straight basically then you've got tibialis posterior flex distorum longus and flex hallucis longus so this is kind of got posterior tibial artery and the fibular artery flex distorum longus has posterior tibial artery and flex hallucis longus has the fibular artery best thing to do when learning this stuff is simply just having to go through it see how it all fits together if you just take like screenshots of this and this it gives you a good starting point of trying to learn lower limb anatomy moving on now to um just a bit of the stuff with the nerves that we haven't actually spoken about yet uh, this is just near the end now so you've got different arteries here You've got the sural, saphenous, and calcaneal. Sural nerve, this is now like sensory. So the sural nerve is, is uh, supplying the lateral side of the foot and the ankle. So if you touch that bit, that's traveling up the sural nerve. Saphenous nerve is the medial side of the foot and the ankle. The calcaneal nerve is the heel. Uh, there will be images online that will show you the divisions in terms of like color coordinated and so they're quite a good place to look for the way that these three interact going on to the next one the deep fibular nerve this is then extensors in the foot so this is them for your toes so if you want to try pointing your toes up that's using the deep fibular nerve then you've got the tibial nerve so this is for long toe flexor muscles <laughs> And so each of the muscles in the toe that can almost like bending your toes and like curling your toes, tibial nerve. Then you've got, if you've got long toe flex muscles, then you've got short toe flex muscles. Now these are all in your foot. So basically, if you have to guess, just guess lateral plantar nerve, unless it's one of these. So flexor hallucis brevis, flexor digitorum brevis, first lumbrical and abductor hallucis. Each of those medial plantar nerve. There is a pathology with the common fibular nerve. This is uh, called foot drop. The reason for this is it's a fairly superficial nerve, so it's easy to get damaged. Guess what foot drop is? Your foot literally just drops and you can't really, you can't um, dorsiflex your foot. Then you've got things like hallux, hallux valgus deformities, so hallux being toe, valgus well we'll get onto that here and then deformities so you probably guess what a deformity is this is basically where your big toe bends towards all the others you've probably heard of this as bunions this is just the medical way of saying that then like i said so you've got varus and valgus what happens here this is a nice little image to help you remember it this is the way that someone's bends uh, their knees bend so if it's varus they point outwards so Varus de pig, um, and the pig's going out because their knee is like bent outwards so the pig can go through. Valgus is their knees are pointed in, so like that. Whereas varus is like that. Um, then if you're going to look at some, I recommend looking at some like x-rays and stuff. The way that the femur will appear will depend based on what kind of pathology is present. So you've got hip fractures and you've got hip dislocations. Hip fractures, the leg will shorten and it'll 
externally rotated hip. Uh, hip dislocations now, there's two types, you can have posterior hip dislocation or an anterior hip dislocation. And so posterior is internally rotated, shortened and adducted. On anterior hip dislocation is externally rotated, it's not shortened and it's adducted. So hopefully that gives you a good summary of lower limb anatomy.